Hi, and welcome to another episode of Lorenzo's Music Podcast, a show where I talk to musicians that I've met online or musicians that I've played on our music show itself because I liked their music. And then I'm like, well, maybe I can meet them and talk to them about what they do. And this one is from the Creative Commons music podcast that I do because like us, they're Creative Commons musicians. And the person I talked to today is based in France, which is funny because here I had to do the interview during the day. And over there, it's like, you know, 10 at night and they're having a glass of wine and it's dark. And so you'll see that if you're watching the video, you'll see that there's definitely a time difference. And you know, they're, they're able to kick back and drink some wine and talk with me, but it's a great talk. They tour all the time. They talk about how they remixed a bunch of songs from their album. They put out a call out for remixes and uh, the label block Sonic that they're on actually had a bunch of musicians make remixes of the song and they have a new album coming out. They tour constantly. It's a great band, a fun anarchist pop punk band, Lewis Ling and the Bombs. So here's the interview starting right now. Hi, my name's Josh, and I'm a, uh, a singer in a punk rock band and a music producer. Yeah. yeah. So you're in Lewis Ling and the Bombs, and I've known you for a while. I've known about your music for a while. Uh, and uh, basically, what's what's been going on? You guys have been releasing stuff and playing out. Tell me about, uh, first of all, it, for everybody listening, where are you located? Uh, we're uh, based in Paris, in France. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm British. I'm British. That's right. Yeah. No, you are British, but you're based in France. How did you get to, how did you get to France again? So why, why are you in France? It was quite random, actually. Yeah. Uh, like one day, my French girlfriend at the time, she said, uh, uh, "We're moving to France because you promised, you promised me that one year, one year ago, you said that you would move to France in one year." And I said, "And I said, I said that really." <laughs> ah, I'm a man of my word, so I moved to France, even though I, I swear she lied. I, I never, I never agreed to this. Right. She just like basically goes, I want to move to France. I know I'll, t he won't, he won't remember. I'll tell him that he told me we would. I had no memory of that at all. In fact, actually, I, ne I didn't even realize that she was going to move to England. She, there was a knock at the door and there she was. Uh, and, 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 and then just on the pavement was her, was her car full of her stuff. <laughs> Wait, and you knew each like, other well, at least beforehand, correct? Yeah, yeah, but she was like, remember, uh, you invited me to live with you? And I was like, oh, shit, I'd totally forgotten about that. <laughs> Damn. How long so ago was this? Uh, oh, that was uh, uh, a long, long time ago when I was in the 90s when I lived in uh, Liverpool. Okay. And uh, so I kind of shouted to my landlord. I said, Alex, is it okay if, uh, if Agnes comes and lives with us? And he was like, yeah, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> and then we started unloading our stuff and i was oh damn i didn't really even like her very much to be honest <laughs> and it was a start of a terrible thing and I, I ended up in france and uh so that's good i like i like this country were you playing music uh in when you were in england or when did you start playing music yeah in uh in liverpool i was in um a digital hardcore band called uh dummy crusher called what a uh, dummy crusher uh crushing crushing the dummies nice uh yeah yeah digital hardcore was all the rage in the 90s so that was cool what do you do in a digital hardcore band i guess i can picture what the music would sound like but i'm trying to picture what you do uh we had uh, well i i was standing there with a the guitar looking cool okay but we but we had one guy with like a a record and his record was just like noise. And then we had one guy with a sampler and all of the samples were just noise. Uh, and then we had one guy with a synthesizer and he kind of made some kind of noise. And then we had a backing track actually playing the actual songs with the beats and everything. So you, <laughs> so you guys made noise and then you had a backing track that basically created the song. Yeah. yeah so yeah, the backing yeah. track was doing all the work is what you're saying. 
the backing track was doing all the work and we were just like making it hard for the audience to even hear the backing track by just making noise okay it was a, it was a concept it was a concept so how did that eventually turn into lewis ling and the bombs well uh when I moved to France, I started playing in like French music cover bands because I thought it'd be nice to like learn about French music. Uh, and I decided I didn't really like that. And then I played in a couple of punk, uh, French punk bands. I played keyboards in a punk band. And then I played, uh, uh, oh, I played keyboards in two punk bands actually. And then uh, I started uh, producing um, uh, rock bands uh actually like quite seriously i quite excited producing bands and uh it's a it's a good story actually. yeah no i was just gonna say how did you start producing rock bands i mean how did what made because you take I, that transition because in paris it's not like it's not like any any city in america uh it's like i uh i would i would go out at night in paris and see these bands and most french bands sucked but like some of them were amazing Okay. amazing and i and and eventually i i found the best french band in all of france at that specific time they were called underground railroad and i uh, and i went to talk to them and i said look uh, i want to make a record for you guys uh has anybody but i guess you know i guess you already have a label and people and they were like no you're the first person to to speak to us really i couldn't i couldn't believe it you know, you go, you go to like uh, any American city. Uh, you're from Madison. You go to Madison mm -hmm. and you see a band. You see a band that's like as good as Nirvana. And you go to talk to them after the show. And, and you say, Do you, I want to make a record with you. And they go, yeah, sure. Because no one else is talking to us. It just, it's amazing. But uh, so that's really cool. Just as to your analogy there, Nirvana did record Nevermind in Madison. So this is where the album was made. <laughs> holy shit that's awesome so yeah, smart I, studios so is where I they did, did it that. so i did that and i made a demo i made a demo for this band uh for a record label called polygram did you wait you for polygram records yeah oh you bastard yeah. okay hold on a second yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so i made so i made yeah but it gets it gets better because i made the i made the record for polygram yeah and i and i gave it to polygram okay they, they then called me they said they loved it mm-hmm they, they they said it's amazing i love we love it we love it and uh so i invited them to a a, a concert a, for for of underground railroad so we were really we were really cooking and uh the the record people they went there and they said uh, uh and, and they watched the concert and they said yeah it was a good concert but where was the songs on the demo and i was like what are you what do you mean yeah and i said where are the songs on the demo because the songs on the demo that we liked was a song called Princess Mononoke. And my, like, my stomach dropped. I realized I'd given them the wrong I CD. Was, I was just going to say. <laughs> I'd given them some early demos that I just did as a joke for, uh, you know, it was just a complete joke. And those were the songs that Polygram liked, not the, not Underground Railroad. <laughs> oh, no. So I made a quick exit from there and my, and my girlfriend, different, different girl uh my girlfriend at the time she said uh, that's now my wife by the way and she said well if those are the songs that the record label likes maybe those are the songs that you need to develop mm -hmm. and so i said okay and i formed lewis thing and the bombs there we are okay so, so it was all the whole thing was just the reaction to a complete accident nice all right all right uh, so then there are a few questions first and then going forward basically how were you producing like so you had just moved to paris what was yeah. your setup like did did you have a studio set up like had you set up a music studio when you got there how were you no, how I were you even have... producing this band no i didn't have anything i didn't have anything i just uh uh for the for the drums i hired a uh, a real studio okay so I, so I just hired a studio and uh again it's a good story i uh I told the I told the guy, yeah, you got to give me your studio. It's uh, it's the best band in France. It's going to be amazing. Uh, you got to give me a good deal. So he gave me a really good deal for one day, uh, and then we recorded all the the drums in one day, and then we left the studio. And he called me right back and said, "Well, you're coming tomorrow, aren't you?" 
And I said, no, no, we finished it. We're out. We've done it. <laughs> and he's like, I only gave you that price because I thought it was going to take a week. And I said, no, no, we're finished. Bye. So, okay. Now, another question. You didn't happen to read KLF's The Manual, did you? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Because <laughs> this sounds very much like that story. <laughs> yes, I am, a, I am a big follower of The Manual. Uh, when, I write, when I write songs, when I produce songs for other people, I follow The Manual. I like it. I like it. It's a fascinating. I, I just finally was able to find a copy or thought to find a copy. It's one of those things where like, I've been able to find things on the internet for years. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, can I just torrent it or something? You know, it, <laughs> and I, I actually ended up finding somebody doing an audio version of it on YouTube. And I was able to listen to it as an audio book. And oh, that was that's great. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. It's like, a, yeah, it's like a, it's almost a religious text that the white that it's uh, it's pretty manual. fascinating. I mean, it even still holds up, even though it's from the '90s. It's still it's yeah. like mm, there's some good stuff in here. Anyway, okay, exactly. so so you did that, and then my next question is, how did you just you recorded this demo? How did you get the ear of Polygram Records? How did you do that? Uh, well. The the Parisian punk scene is quite a small scene. Uh, there's only like if we, when well back in those days, uh, which was the early two thousands. Uh, if you're talking about rock music, mm -hmm. only a few hundred people. So I would go to the rock bars, and in the rock bars, uh, a few of the people in the rock bars were um, were A and R people for for Polygram. So I just kind of like. Uh, bumped into those guys but well, i so never they were already hanging out in the area yeah oh yeah, yeah. you're in paris you have an advantage <laughs> yeah yeah it's like it's it's the equivalent of la and, and new york rolled into one right i'm thinking of it like there are no there are no record producers in our town here and it's like oh yeah because i'm in madison <laughs> yeah if you're in la you just go to any 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 like music bar and and you'd eventually bump into a, a record uh a record industry dude okay all right all right that actually makes a lot more sense now that's not as far of a leap for me to try and understand okay now after that you said so then you formed lewis ling and the bombs but you had to find people it was at this point it was just you wasn't it it was just me uh and then uh i i made a kind of pact because because the songs came from random jokes that i'd been making uh with my girlfriend at the time uh completely randomly there was like we, like I wrote, I wrote a song called conspiracy uh which is still like the fan favorite mm -hmm. and uh we wrote that song just as a joke because we were watching uh youtube and we discovered that youtube was was just full of conspiracies like lizard peoples and stuff like that it was amazing i suppose it's even even more amazing now but there was some really far out conspiracies on youtube and uh now those conspiracies so, have sponsorships <laughs> yeah yeah now, hey, i'm going to tell you this they're... conspiracy theory but remember exactly. check out our sponsor now it's, uh, now it's like this crazy conspiracy theory sponsored by elon musk or whatever mm -hmm. but back in, back in those days it was underground man yeah it was, it was underground you didn't have uh, you didn't have billionaires supporting it right. it was just like just like some dude like with a cardboard cut out of a lizard person saying you know that was it was crazy so uh well, I did that, and then I said, and I said uh, to myself, everything in this band is going to be random. Uh, so it's just going to be random stuff. So to make the band, I called up, uh, I called up a great guitarist that I knew, and I said, and I said, hey, can you give me the number of your brother? So he gave me the number of his brother, and I called him, and I said, hey, dude, you got to play, you got to play guitar in my band, and he said, I can't play guitar. And I said, I don't care because your brother plays a mean guitar. So I'm sure you're going to play guitar. So I And he said, I don't play guitar and I don't want to be in your band. And I said, OK, OK, we're practicing at this time in this place. And he and he came and he came. <laughs> Did he even have a guitar? I mean, how does this work? I can call he up borrowed, any random person borrowed, and go, you're he, my guitarist. Yeah, yeah. He borrowed he borrowed a guitar uh, and uh, he was terrible. He really, really was bad. Uh, but he looked cool. And, uh, is that and why brought... you chose him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all and right, he, all right. He, he brought with him. He brought with him a kind of uh, a, a kind of drummer, um, and then and that's basically how everybody was recruited in the band. It was just kind of random. Uh, so the guitarist who didn't play guitar said, "I brought a drummer, which it's like bonus for you, less work to do." 
Yeah, and... exactly. Um, okay. Uh, very early on, very early on, I uh, there was a there was a girl that I that that is the still the coolest girl in in the world. Uh, that is Juliet, and um, and uh, she, I wanted her to be in my band. Uh, she's half Japanese, half French, and uh, she was just doing backing vocals. But every concert we did because we did concerts straight away we didn't practice at all we just played concerts like the germs yeah we didn't practice at, uh, we, we didn't practice like the stage all, like, was your practice exactly because i'd uh, had enough experience in bands to already know that practicing is just a waste of money it's just a waste of time no one cares <laughs> um but we just we're actually playing playing gigs is like being paid to practice so that's good that's a good point much, i like that much better. yeah much better and also the audience really like can gives them a chance to actually like you and when, when they see that you're rubbish they they actually like you i don't know what if you go and see a band and they just like terrible mm -hmm. uh you instantly kind of like like them so we we I don't know about that but okay i see i see where you're getting at <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, but 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 when we were on stage, we really we were jump we jumped around in all all directions. It was chaos, chaos, total chaos. Mm -hmm. And we always put and we always put Juliet in the middle as if she was the lead singer. But at that time, she had like like three things to say in the whole set. Uh, but we always put her in the middle, and and eventually she kind of turned to me. She said, "Why are you putting me in the middle?" And I said, "Cause you cause you're the lead singer." And she said, "Am I?" And I said yes, and then she became the lead singer. And now most of the most of the songs she sings the lead on most of them. Okay. Now, <laughs> what would if if Juliet didn't know that they were the lead singer? What were what was Juliet doing up to that point? She was just doing a couple of oohs and ahs in the band. Okay, and the rest of you but, were you chanting or just and, playing? Like what? I'm just trying to picture this whole process in my head. It was kind of it was kind of chaotic. Uh, it was kind of chaotic, but uh, uh, I was I was I'd already had quite a lot of experience with like songwriting at that by that point. Okay. Uh, even though it was at the beginning of the band, so I so I'd written uh, pretty basic songs uh, that were catchy and very memorable. So I knew that they couldn't you couldn't go wrong, uh, mm -hmm. and around them around them the the uh, things things got a bit crazy especially sometimes with the structures went completely nuts because uh, you're just on stage and you're going at like maximum speed you can yeah and and you can't slow down to think so things things go things go out of control but basically they they it all came all came together and and the, the parisian the parisian punks grew, grew to love us so that was cool it was very nice Okay. How often were you doing these shows, even when you were just starting out? Like, how of, how often were you playing? About once a week. Okay. We play, and we would play often in illegal squats around uh, around Paris because there nice. was quite a lot. There was quite a lot of squats back in those days. It was really cool. Um, and uh, these squat concerts were uh, like a an open. There's no rules. Like literally no rules. So artistically and how you how you what you did with yourself mm -hmm. with yourself so there was there was a lot of craziness but it was really cool very very uh, a good place to develop uh, an artistic voice it was very good yeah and and you've really kept that up i mean i am just so impressed by the amount of shows that you play uh, even today like I, yeah whenever i see you online it's like pictures of here we are we just played here or we're gonna play here you just did something recently that was in what'd you say it was in like a an old police bunker oh, or yeah. something like that what was that that's true we played in a squad that was an old um uh gendarmerie uh gendarmerie is a kind of military police okay uh, so it's an old military police uh um uh place and the and the, the squatters they even kept the uh the drunk tank and mm -hmm. the drunk tank is incredible so we went we went in the drunk tank it was like the scariest place very very freaky but we uh yeah and they and they just kind of set up a um uh, uh a nightclub in the basement and it was um the basement was actually mud it, there was no there's no concrete there it was, was no a mud floor. floor there was a mud floor uh and uh, we thought it was going to be because it's pretty weird 
So we thought there was going to be like four people, but it was, a, it was packed. It was packed out and people were bouncing off the walls and there was like crowd surfing and stuff. Okay. Uh, and, and literally the mud turned into a kind of like um, mist or something. You, it was like everywhere. It was Everybody was covered in it at the end of the, the night. Okay. It's kind of cool. Kind of cool. And now because of the amount of touring you do and just how Im- impressive the the shows and places you play are me i'm curious as to how are you doing this how are you booking these shows i mean booking shows for me is a nightmare you yeah know, how how do you go about doing so many shows and playing out and finding places to play that is you're going to be disappointed with the answer Uh-oh. um because the answer is we don't we just don't try uh we oh, actually we actually, re- <laughs> we actually refuse we actually refuse half of the shows that we're offered um but we but we have a reputation of accepting enough that people people still offer for for example we were offered a show the next show we're going to play is our christmas show uh at a bar called the balto which which is a bar nobody knows of and uh, we accepted it because we didn't have anything else on we regret it now because they now they apparently there's police problems and and there's risks of uh, police being called during the show and stuff. So okay. I kind of regret accepting this gig, but we accept lots, but we refuse lots as well. And that's just, a f- we've been around for 16 years now. Yeah. So um, we've kind of built up enough momentum. And you've way. probably got a good list of people to reach out to if you're setting something up. Cause you're, you're going, you're calling it a world tour right now, aren't you? Uh, when we, the, the last time we went to Germany, we called it a world tour. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it was just really, it was just France and Germany, really. Okay. Uh, we have played Belgium, Holland, uh, Britain, uh, 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 uh that, and that's all. That's our world tour. <laughs> all right. We were, we, we, we booked a tour in Japan, uh, but we didn't go cause it was too expensive. Yeah. Uh, we were invited to play the uh, festival in the Zapatistas with the Zapatista uh, Rebellion, uh, but we didn't go because it was too expensive as well. Okay, no, <laughs> but that w- that would have been cool. Uh, totally, and because uh, Marcos uh, uh, Marcos was a fan of the band, he actually played us on his radio show. Oh, they asked you to go there, is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. See, that's the thing is people are asking you to go places and me, it's like, I have to call people up and they're like, let me get back to you. And maybe you hear back. And if you don't, they're like, we don't have a date or we can give you a day on like, you know, a Monday or something like that. It's it, which that's fine. And we've done that, but still it's like, I I feel like it's hard to find people to go do it's things to the like, point yeah, where we don't even of- play out of town really. It was cheating. We cheated, really, because, uh, uh, for example, the Zap- with the Zapatistas, we did a song called Zapatista, where we're, we're and where the, the chorus is, Ya basta, uh, which is what the Zapatistas say. And, uh, and the entire lyrics were uh, English translations of poetry uh, that Marcos uh, has said in his manifestos. Oh. So it was like a sure thing. <laughs> right the, the chat that the people in the chapas were gonna like we're gonna like that that song it's punk and it, it's talking about them it's mm-hmm. in english and the english that it's in is is ripping ripping off exactly what they like so it were, it's kind of cheating you know if you or smart i mean it's i wouldn't call it cheating it's actually pretty strategic yeah it's strategic but also we actually genuinely do love we genuinely do love these people as well we yeah. love them so it's it's a, it comes from a genuine place, but it is it was just cheap, like pure pure cheating. Okay. And the album you put out recently, uh, which was in 2021, wasn't it? Yeah, 2021. Yeah. So how did you go about making that album? Uh, did you also book out some studio time for that? Are you self producing now? Like, how are you making uh, your now, albums these days? Now we have we are the luckiest the luckiest band in the world. Well, it's not exactly luck. We built our own studio. Oh, you did. <laughs> We have an we have our own studio and it's awesome. It, uh, I it took took me six months uh, of work. Now, when you I say built, build, do you mean you found a place and then made a studio in it, or are you saying you physically it, put up the walls? 
I put up the walls. Uh, oh, it, okay. I I rented a I rented a um, uh, a warehouse, a hundred meter square warehouse, and I built the walls and the floors and the ceilings, everything inside wow. it. And it, it was a bit of a it was a bit of work. Uh huh. Uh, six months. It took us six months, and uh, but but now we have like um, a top tier commercial recording studio, so that's pretty cool. I want to say six months is actually really fast. Exactly. Now looking back at it, now I'm going wow because uh, I do know like commercial recording studios mm-hmm. that that uh, that took ten times more money to build and uh, and two or three times more more time with huge teams of people. And so now looking back at it, I'm like, oh, yeah, we did well. We so did well. where is this place? Uh, just in Pantin, which is about two minutes outside of Paris. You can't. Okay, so it's not like in your backyard or anything like that is what you're saying. What? Sorry. It's not like in your backyard or anything you're saying. No. You, you, you went somewhere and built it. Yeah, yeah. It's in a, commercial, in a commercial area with lots of, lots of other studios. So it's in a prime spot. Okay. That's oh, that's impressive. I like that. So, how long did the album take to make then? Uh, well, that's interesting because after after Favela Ninja, which was uh, the album before, uh, we had vowed as a group uh, never to make an album again. Uh, because, Why? Uh, because Favela Ninja took us three years to make. Oh yeah, I could see that. Then. And we lost, and we lost a, a drummer during it during the making of it uh the band nearly split up a few times it was tough it was really tough to make for Vela ninja so we uh, we kind of like made a pact not to make any albums ever again so when we made uh um oh, what's the name of the album uh disruption detected mm-hmm. um checking system disruption detected when we made that record uh it we thought we were making an ep that's what we thought we were doing Mm. We thought we were making a single, uh, an EP. Uh, it was only Mike from Block Sonic that realized it could be an album, really. For us, it was just an EP. Well, how, he, did, how did he realize it as more? If you, I mean, an EP is like we have four songs or whatever. How uh, did it become he, all the songs that they are? Well, um, it was actually, that's actually, it was a surprise to everybody. We put, we put a call out on Block Sonic for remixes, mm. and uh, normally those kind of things just get like a couple of a couple of replies. Yeah, but we got we got eighteen eighteen remixes back. Yeah, because you even made EPs out of those. Exactly. So we made a a ton of EPs out of just the remixes that we got from people. Yeah. So it was really good. So we were able to make a kind of whole. Not just an album, but a whole release schedule with lots of lots of singles. Nice. It's funny. I actually had talked to Mike about doing that. I haven't heard back from him yet, but I reached out and then I saw that you had done that. And I was like, oh, that's kind of kismet. I was like, okay, so he is interested in doing that. And also the fact that we're more of like a lo-fi rock band. And I was like, Are any, is anybody going to want to remix that? And I'm like, oh, but you're like a fast punk band. So they were able to remix that. So, you know, maybe it can yeah, be done, anything's you know? Possible. I, I could, I mean, a lot of these remixes, you can hear the limit of what they were able to do. Because mm-hmm. you can hear it's out of time and and that it's pushing the limit of what Ableton Live or whatever right. program they're using can actually handle. Okay. You know? Were you sending them stems or were they just doing it off of the source material? Like how were they making these uh, remixes? Some of them took the stems, which were made available by Mike, uh, very on his, on his, um, on his uh, website. And some of them, uh, specifically a kind of like dyslexic guy who does kind of like experimental music. He took the whole, like the whole thing and just like chopped it up. Okay. Just uh, the, 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 the two track master instead of the stems he just chopped it up into a million bits and uh, made a kind of destructured version uh but most people took the stems i think okay and that's what i was wondering is if you were offering the stems where were you putting them so you just exported those and gave them to mike and mike put them on the yeah. block stop so yeah yeah, yeah. We, owe, label we owe a lot to mike because really he he was kind of like the visionary of all that of all that side because okay. we didn't because we didn't really see much in the project except that it was like a 
a glorified EP. We didn't we didn't realize that it had the potential to be anything else, really. Yeah. He he's the one that saw the potential in it more than us. Okay. And then for the the band, you release your stuff on Bandcamp, but do you I mean, I know you don't have a website. Do you do you want a website? Like how come you don't have a website? Uh we've done a few websites over the years, but they've always like gone out of uh I think we have some websites somewhere because of, <laughs> I, I don't think they disappear off the net, but nobody ever went to them. So we kind of just like forgot about them and just, oh, okay. like, life's too busy. You know, we get like, like just for Louis Ling, I get tons of emails per week uh, to deal with. I can't, I, I, like no, none of oh, them. You poor thing. <laughs> yeah. To deal with it. <laughs> All these people reaching out to you, liking your music. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. It's a good, I'm, I'm, honestly, it's a good, uh, we have good times, good times. Yeah. And what, so now that you've released that album and you've got these remixes, I mean, what do you have in the works right now? Are you back to, we're never going to make an album again? I, yes. We okay, are back because to, that sparks uh, an entire finished, album and then people following you and you putting out remixes, right? No, we just finished a, a, an EP. We just finished an EP. Oh, you did? So that's it. It's it's done. And uh, I actually sent it to, I've actually, I've actually sent it to Block Sonic and we're sorting out a release date. So it's Tell done. me about the album. Uh, the EP? Yeah, the EP. No, Sorry, the EP. No albums, man. No <laughs> albums ever again. <laughs> Uh, the EPs, three songs, three songs, uh, a Japanese song. Okay. Uh, that is the first song to be written by our drummer and, and, and obviously Juliet, the, the, the singer. So I didn't, I didn't have a hand in it at all. It was entirely the drummer and the singer doing their thing. So I'm mm -hmm. very proud of them. So that's finally, I'm free. I don't need to write songs anymore. <laughs> And then, uh, and then the other one is "They Stole the Rave," which is something that I always wanted to do. I always wanted to do a song, uh, kind of like a rave rock song. Really, uh, and it, it, it's really something I'm really happy with. Uh, so that's cool. Okay, uh, I'm really happy with how that turned out. It's kind of like how how I always imagined uh, what a rave would be would sound like if it was with guitars. So that's cool. Okay. Uh, and it was written about a, a real thing that happened during the COVID. Uh, because during COVID, um, uh, the police in the north of, uh, of uh, France, northwest of France, uh, they threw this boy in uh, the river and he drowned. And then they pretended that they didn't do it for for months they pretended they didn't do it and then they eventually found his body and then the police came clean and said they did it uh and then uh the kids of the area decided to organize a rave to as a kind of like uh send-off for the kids okay uh i was trying well, to figure out how a rave fits into this okay that makes sense then. yeah so they so they organized a big rave and uh well it was during covid so I kind of see the see why this rave was forbidden, mm -hmm. but the but the police turned up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vans, really, and and they were really angry. And of course, the ravers filmed everything because it's you know it's two it's the two thousands now, right? But the police were were not really they're not really understanding that they are they they were all being live filmed. So I I was watching Facebook Live while this was happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, and what was amazing, what was so poetic, is that police. Okay, so police were beating people, but what was what was incredibly poetic is that the police were also beating the Technics twelve tens and the subwoofers and the speakers, like with the mat with their truncheons, hmm. and they even had knives as well. They were and they were stabbing the speakers. Okay, and some of the some of the police were actually screaming with uh, with anger whilst they were stabbing speakers it was it was an incredible bit of uh, film um mm. you know and some of them were like they were stamping on like record players and things like that yeah and they were like and they were shouting while they were doing it so i suppose they were affected by covid as well in some way right uh, but you could tell that they were uh, they were not sane they were not sane at all so there's a kind of like madness that was gripping society at that time mm -hmm. in the in covid 
and that's perfect for a song really <laughs> it's yeah. kind of like this kind of madness of the generation like the police completely losing it and also obviously people raving uh i'm not exactly in their best uh you know all there either mm-hmm. so so it's kind of a, a great thing for a song there we, so there we are when do you think this is uh this ep is going to be released uh uh, with uh, our friends at Block Sonic, we were thinking about April. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's I. I didn't know you had you had something in the works. That's really cool. And then yeah, exactly. And what kind of stuff do you have coming up? Otherwise, like shows or projects or things that you're doing. What other things do you have coming up that you'd like to mention? Uh, um, I I oh I did a I did a I did a solo a solo record actually. No, um, that I'm going to release as soon as uh, as soon as possible. Uh, I'm looking for a band name for that for the for the band. Actually, that's why I haven't uh, done the front cover yet. You've made an entire album, but you haven't thought of what you're going to call it yet. Not an album. No, six, sorry. Song e- six song EP. Six. Songs. You said record, so I assumed it was an album. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, <laughs> it's six songs. Six songs of of uh, hardcore punk this time. So just purely hardcore. Yeah. So, because I, I I was feeling I was feeling angry, I think. Okay. I've been angry this last month. So, um, uh, so yeah, that's exciting. That's oh. an exciting thing because I've never done a solo a solo project before. Because being the main songwriter in a band, uh, you don't. There's no need to do a, a solo project. Right. You don't feel. You don't actually feel this like backed up creatively. Uh, because you're like the main songwriter, mm-hmm. and now the drummer and the uh, and the drummer and my singer have kind of taken over. I kind of like thought it was a good a good opportunity for me to express a darker a darker side, <laughs> a darker side. Because over the years you haven't been fulfilled with your dark side yet, and now you're just exactly. really getting down there. <laughs> exactly. Well, because the, the the concept of Louis Ling. Uh, uh, and uh, Louis Ling and the Bombs is always the, well, it was always pop music. Yeah. Uh, but then I realized that um, the the in in France there was no there was no pop music written for anarchist people, and mm. there was a lot of anarch- a lot of anarchist people in France. So so I put a lot of uh, of uh, anarchist politics into the music, and that immediately gave us an audience which was very nice because a lot of anarchist music was, was, unli- you know, it was very based around, uh, you know, very fast, hardcore, uh, um, and noise core and things like that. But there hadn't been in France, there hadn't been up to that point much like really pop, poppy music. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then if, uh, so people want to listen to you, where would you suggest that they should go listen to you? Uh well, they can go to Block Sonic, obviously. Mm-hmm. That's good. But uh, our favorite, our favorite website is Bandcamp because you know, and it's only recently that I don't like Bandcamp anymore because they're union busters. I didn't know that until very recently. Um, the new company that just bought them are union busters, but uh, we love Bandcamp. We love Bandcamp. So go to mm-hmm. Lewis Ling and the Bombs on Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Although now, now I feel a bit, a bit dirty because uh, you know now I know that the, that the bat, that the cut that is going to Bandcamp, is going to uh, a bunch of union busters. Man, who would, have, who would have thought it? I never would have. That's terrible. Well, I want to thank you for talking with me today because I am not a union buster and I enjoyed talking. No, with you today. that's good. <laughs> Don't bust, don't bust unions, dudes. And uh, yeah, no, thanks. It's been great talking with you. That's been, it's been a pleasure.